What is going on, guys? Welcome to the Wednesday live stream. Today we have on Aaron. How the heck are you, Aaron? Hey, how's it going, Devin? Thanks for having me on. Always good to see you. How's things lately? Things are good. Uh, you know, warmer than most of the rest of the country. So uh, for everyone who's mm -hmm. freezing out there in the U.S. and uh, obviously you in Canada as well. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Hope you guys are doing all right and your tanks uh, are not froze over. Yeah. No, actually, it's not too bad right now, but the last week has been like the coldest week of the year for me, I'd say. So, but thankfully everything's running. I do have a bunch of buddies down in Texas and other places and they are definitely having some issues there with power cutting in and out and other things. And I helped one buddy today just build a battery backup, you know, remotely helping him nice. with it. Hey, tilt your camera down a little bit. Your eyes are like cut off on my screen. How's that? Or, or sorry, tilt it up, brother. Oh, tilt it up. Okay. There we go. I got you. Perfect. Perfect. It was like the Wilson, but the reverse. Oh, okay. <laughs> Better now? Yep. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's been definitely crazy times. So last minute topic add in, just kind of talk about power outages and what to do in those emergency situations. Have you ever had to have deal with that on your tank? I, I have. Uh, so growing up uh, originally from Buffalo, so, you know, we're no uh, shortage to uh, the bad weather power outages. So, mm -hmm. you know, growing up, we always had a generator in the house and that, that nice. the fish tank was on a dedicated line. So uh, we always made sure when, you know, winter would come that we'd have enough gas for the generator and far too often, you know, we had to use it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the other thing that we would do is, again, because it would, wouldn't be able to power the entire tank as normal, you know, we would wrap uh, the tank in one of those thermal blankets, one of those like um, yep. mesh, metal looking uh, aluminum ones. And yep. that would at least help uh, to cover the top of it and as much as possible to make sure that we didn't lose as much heat. Because uh, you never know, you know, uh, again, in Buffalo, sometimes the heat could be out for a day, sometimes the power out for several days. So, you know, those were the things that you would do in the winter to make sure that uh, you had everything OK. You know, the other things were making sure you had like the battery backup for a, a bubbler. You know, mm -hmm. So if you don't have a battery backup uh, in your tank, that at least there's some oxygen going to keep the bacteria alive, both in the tanker and the sump. So, yep. yeah, it's definitely uh, you know, something that growing up uh, has been I, I've been used to. <laughs> Uh, you know, here in Southern California, you know, we've gotten more and more wind related power outages. So hmm. I just recently bought the Ice Cab V3 battery backup, which. Uh, Ooh, how is uh, it? I, I mean, I haven't had to use it okay. yet, so uh, knock on wood, but uh, the peace of mind is there. And uh, I have it powering or set to power my two uh, Geyer um, uh, FX 330s. So um, mm -hmm. they should be good to go. I, you know, I'm thinking about adding a second one to it just in case, or even something a little bit bigger uh, to help with my return pump. So definitely nice. uh, thinking about power outages as, you know, yep. we're all dealing with them in different ways. Mm -hmm. It, it kind of made me laugh because, like, I'm not dealing with anything personally right now, but as I'm helping other people deal with it and, like, explaining how to build battery backups, I'm like, I have this one battery backup sitting here not even plugged in. I'm like, oh, I got to do this now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's something that... Uh, I didn't think of until I kept getting all the alerts from the power company saying, mm -hmm. you know, a chance of it going off, chance of it going off. And yes. after like the 20th one, I said, okay, it's time to be responsible about this. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. So do you, would you have any, is yours actually hooked up right now or you just have it waiting to hook it up? I, I do actually have it hooked up. Uh, okay. I, I let it charge uh, off off of the, um, you know, the wall before I plugged in the, the, uh, the pumps to it for a nice. couple of days. But now I have it uh, sit in circuit and, uh, you know, it, it's tucked behind the tank. Uh, I probably should mount it uh, on the back of the, uh, the stand somewhere back there. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's there. It's, it's working when it, when, it, when it will need to be. Perfect. That's what matters. Um, yeah. yeah, let me know how that one is when you use it. It's one I haven't tried yet. So I've used the Ecotech one and then I have a DIY one on my other tank. So. And then, yeah, you know, it's uh, the V3 just came out, um, you know, right around Christmas. So, you know, I, I don't know anyone else who has it either. But, uh, you know, when I saw that uh, they were dropping it, I, I was pretty quick to, to jump on in to give it a try. So uh, mm -hmm. I'll definitely let you know and, and let the you know those uh, who are curious if any questions, you know, hit me yeah. up. And uh, yeah, I can I can let you know. Nice. Now, do you, you said you had a generator. Do you see or when you're growing up, do you have one now still or? When I was growing up, I had one. Uh, right now, we don't have one. Uh, it, it's probably something that that I'll look into as well uh, for the for the mm -hmm. house, especially with the baby around. You know, uh, just being able to heat up her stuff is is you know, the safe way to go. So, 
you yep. know, when, we, when I get those warnings now, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that I have enough hot water for her milk and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's probably a good idea for the baby. Yep. No, definitely. Um, just reading the comments here, talk about running, running the tank off my truck converter, which is a good thing. Actually, I went to the BRS or Saltwater Aquarium. They both had streams on power outages and dealing with stuff today. And one of the two, like a lot of the newer trucks and vehicles have an inverter built into it. So you can yeah. run just a big extension cord to your house and power stuff that way if you needed to. I know a couple of folks uh, here in California who use their Tesla as a, uh, a power station for their tanks. So uh, it's a know. whole slew of batteries. It's not a bad idea. <laughs> Why not? Right. Uh, you know, it, yeah. it has me thinking more about, you know, using the whole battery backup system of, of a Tesla battery pack uh, for your tank know, solar or whatnot. Yeah. And, yep. uh, you know, I know, uh, you know, Phil was on a couple or we were talking a couple of weeks ago and he, he was talking about his uh, you know, wanting to add what 30 more future uh, fuel cells to his already 20. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it's definitely something that uh, looking for alternative forms of power is a good way to go. No, exactly. I have um, on the side of my deck, I did this years ago when I was just like learning experiment. I put 400 watts of panels up to some really big deep cycle batteries that power all like my landscape lighting and stuff. Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking about fishing a line up through the attic and down to the tank and use that just like a super duper backup for power heads and all that. You know, I think it's the way to go. Uh, unfortunately, mm-hmm. I have not seen a, uh, a a very good system for us briefers on how to use solar. You know, I, I've seen some hacks and stuff like that, but um, I don't think anyone has cracked that ability to tap into solar yet uh, for our aquariums. And I think part of it, it's like we use so much wattage, you know, <laughs> whether it's, uh, you know, I, between two and 4,000 watts a day that I think we're using. So, it's you know, a that, that, that's a huge chunk of power to look at solar. Yep. Uh, no, it's true. Uh, that's a good point, Greg. Um, biggest issue for them in Texas is heat. Which is yeah. true, because everyone talks about battery backups, and I've never even really worried about heating the tanks. I'm like, it's not going to get that cold. But, I mean, you never know. <laughs> yeah, you know, even running some yeah. of those on, on a heat exchange as well, you know, whether it be a, you know, a, a fan to help keep the, uh, the sump cool or the top of the tank cool. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, th- those are definitely issues. And, you know, uh, like two and others have talked about, you know, the humidity that they get in Texas as well. So, yeah. you know, we're so dry here in, in Southern California that we deal with different issues as opposed to, uh, you know, other, other parts of the state and country. That's true. Um, now, for keeping the heat in the tank, one thing I was thinking, too, is putting a top on it, right? Yeah. Like a chunk of acrylic or glass or anything, really, right? To stop the evaporation, which is going to keep the heat in, too, if you're dealing with cold. Yeah, that's why, I, you know, I used to use those thermal blankets growing up, and you just, like, literally put it right over the front. Uh, yeah. I- and that would do a great job on that. But uh, again, you're not going to get any light penetration through it. But if you have no power, you're not going to be worried about light to begin with. Yeah, exactly. No, those Mylar blankets are good idea, actually, because if you have a screen top, you already have like a structure on top, structure right? And, and they on. weigh nothing. They're super thin tinfoil, basically. And you yeah. can drape it over and it would cut down like drastically on your evaporation, which would make a big difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And definitely things that I, I think anyone uh, in the hobby should have. It's one of those uh, good safeguards to have that you never know and you hope you don't need to use it. But if you do, it's good to good to have there. That's true. Now I'm actually thinking I'm going to have to pick up some of those now. It is a good idea to keep it and they take up no space. That's so a good idea. Yeah, literally you could shove it in a, in a hole anywhere and it, you know, yep. they're good to go. Mm-hmm. No, exactly. So, yeah, I mean... We've done tons of stuff on like battery backups and power heads. I mean, battery air pumps. But yeah, he- heating's just one I've never really considered, and now I know so many people dealing with it. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I- I'm even running. So I have two 300 watt uh, heaters on the tank, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, in- inside the house here in the evening, you know, it'll it'll get down to 63, 64 degrees, and it struggles to keep my tank, you know, at at 77. Like lately. It's been going down to like 74, 74.5, you know, which again isn't terrible, but you know, to have uh, two 300 watt heaters really just uh, struggling to keep it at temperature, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that's not that much of a heat differential between you know 65 and you know and 76, but you know, mm-hmm. they're uh, they're definitely struggling right now. Well, the tricky part too is like heaters take a lot of power, right? And they would destroy a battery backup pretty quick. Cause I mean, that's kind of generator territory if you're worrying about heat heaters and all the other gear on your tank. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, I think you and I were talking about it offline was uh, mm-hmm. how I wanted to put my L2 out of the water because I realized just how much heat it actually generated in the tank. And, and again, yeah. you know, uh, 
California summers get much hotter, so I run the AC a lot more than mm -hmm. you know most of the rest of the year. And so I noticed that there was like between a two and four degree difference that the L2 or the L1 at the time uh, would make in the tank. And so I thought if I could find a way to get it out of the water, it'd be a lot cooler in the tank and then mm -hmm. the chiller would kick on less and whatnot. But uh, at the end of the day, I couldn't work out the plumbing and get it to be configured okay, so uh, I got to put it in the water. But um, you know, just looking at yeah. you know, what's your climate and the environment that you have to deal with, is it heat mm -hmm. or is it you know, cold that you need to deal with more yeah. often and how do you adjust for that? Even what's kind of funny, like my house is like kind of, the downstairs is like half underground, like a split level or whatever. And then the upstairs is not. And downstairs, I never had any issues with the tank getting too hot. Or upstairs, I do. Sure, so it's funny. Even within a house, just the different floors, how much of a temperature differential there can be. Yeah, yeah, but, exactly. Mm -hmm. oh, that's crazy. Okay, so another thing you've been playing with lately, you're, you're starting to play with CO2 scrubbing as well. Yeah, so uh, yep. you know, again, looking at the idea of stability of pH, and um, you know, I did some experiments, uh, and uh, some of them didn't go so hot. So uh, I've had to re uh, recalibrate what is a safe level of the aquarium and what mm. what the proper pH is. And you know, obviously, the temperature <laughs> here is coming to be a little bit more warmer. It's like 68 degrees out right now, so I am able to mm. leave the windows open, and so. You know, I'm able to get a, a more natural pH uh, you nice. know, during the day of, you know, 8, 8 2, 8, 3. Um, however, you know, it's still dropping, you know, just below 8 to, to just above 8 at night. And mm -hmm. so knowing that the, the, the tank is in the middle of like an open floor dining room, kitchen, uh, living room, you know, it's pulling a lot of uh, air from the CO2 scrubber. And I basically exhaust the media within four days. I leave it on Ooh. for six days. Fast. And it's so super fast. And then mm -hmm. afterwards, I start to see, you know, the return, uh, the, the effectiveness really diminish. So um, after thinking about that and eliminating one of my experiments, you know, I wanted to find a better way, a safer way to help to stabilize the pH. And so I started looking into CO2 scrubbers. And I know BRS uh, has done some videos on it lately. And, you know, they're, uh, they're different versions of that and the smaller ones versus larger, single chamber versus double chamber. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's really had me thinking about being able to tap into the two oxygen ports that I have for the Great White uh, GW17 and yeah. pull that right into the CO2 scrubber. And um, one of the things I've recently had an aha moment when watching another video was how CO2 scrubbers like more humid, not wet, but humid air as opposed yep. to like CO2, which is drier. And so, you know, mine I had um, in a pretty dry space, like, you know, tucked on the top of the tank that got a lot of the heat. So it was very dry. So mm -hmm. uh, I noticed when I actually just put it in one of those like takeaway plastic containers and so it's just pulling water um, through that and, and around the sides that hmm. I was able to get higher pH uh, from that just because it's pulling right from within that cylinder inside of the sump. And so that had me thinking, you know, again, if I did one of those dual chambers um, and had some, you know, water in the bottom of it, I could keep moist air in there uh, hmm. and allow it to run much more effectively than, than before. I currently have it was just looking at the entire system. So my plan is to be able to look at that and find... Um, you know, the right size and chamber to be able to run into a, a recirculating system. Yep. Nice. I've been debating the whole recirculating one. Um, I still haven't figured out if there's any negative effects of ozone on it. So we'll see. Yeah. So I, I did find a couple of papers on it and looking, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, using the Y splitter right at the base uh, tends to be the most effective way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the detriment is that if, if CO2 hits ozone, you run the risk of spontaneous combustion. Hmm. Like. <laughs> so you've got to, yeah, you, you're literally ready to nuke your system. Um, and the military, I, I read this in one of the Reef to Reef uh, blog posts. I'll send it to you. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's actually talking just about that, how you know, being able to, uh, to change uh, the order of that has an impact on whether mm -hmm. or not you can nuke your system. So for me, uh, I, I actually have decided that, you know what, I, I'd rather do recirculating as one system and mm -hmm. put an ozone reactor uh, and keep that separate. So I've been looking Fair. at the, uh, the Avast uh, uh, CO2 reactor as mm -hmm. a, a system. And again, with the baby, it's a much safer way to go, which is why I wasn't running it to begin with. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think uh, coming down the pike, I'm going to invest in uh, the Avast uh, CO2 uh, 
uh, hmm. unit to, to be able to, uh, or sorry, the vast ozone unit to, uh, to run the tank. I have to look that up. I haven't even looked at that one yet. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's only been around uh, maybe a year and a half or so. Uh, mm -hmm. There isn't a lot of videos on YouTube. So, uh, Dan, if you're watching this, uh, <laughs> some extra videos would be great. So, yep. um, or maybe we can get one and we can do a video on it. Never know. There you go. Huh, interesting. So, yeah, yeah I, mean, cool. I mean, so again, a lot of people mm -hmm. just use an extra skimmer on it, but, uh, you know, having the dedicated chamber to help to absorb or dispel some of the extra ozone, um, I, to me, is a safer way to go. And it keeps the dedicated skimmer as a skimmer and the ozone and ozone reactor to go so that they allow and function independently. Yeah. You could use like a little Y splitter and have a port for the ozone and a port for recirculating, and a little solenoid, and just pick whatever one's on so you could turn off the recirculating as you do it. Correct, and uh, I did look at some of the videos and the <laughs> difference between a, the ball valve a solenoid versus yeah. just a regular solenoid. Um, definitely an interesting uh, way to go. Um, mm -hmm. Being a gear junkie like I know you are as well, I'm kind of keen to try another piece of technology. Yep. Oh, it never hurts. <laughs> That's right. And again, I don't know if anyone in the chat uh, has tried uh, their ozone reactor or tried mixing uh, ozone plus um, recirculating. If so, definitely would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I'm really curious. This is something I've been trying to research, but it's hard to find much information on it because it's not really something that most people would do. So, It, it isn't, and some of the, the threads I found were like a decade old. And mm -hmm. so, you know, this is obviously when you looked at uh, ozone's popularity in years in years past, you know, some of these discussions were a lot more prevalent than they are now. So, uh, you know, as ozone's becoming the, the new in vogue thing, I think you're going to start to see some of these yep. uh, conversations uh, uh, again. Mm -hmm. So I just had a look to see how long it was, but it was about two months ish ago, according to oh, YouTube, yeah. of when I did that last video on my ozone, November 23rd. So the last week, my pH has been starting to drop. And I think my ozone might be getting exhausted. I'm not sure. So I got to go crawl up in, or not my ozone, the CO2 media. CO2 media. And you, if I remember, you don't have yours um, linked through. You just have it pulling, you know, simultaneously, right? You, you're not uh, channeling one to the second? Yeah. There were just three, three in tandem. Three in tandem, yeah. So I don't, do you think it'd make a difference if it was doing a loop or versus in tandem? I think that you'd be able to get more life out of the media because you'd be able to uh, delete uh, and throw away the first chamber first and then work through and keep adding and, you know, moving the mm. chambers over. Yeah, that could be. I, I was curious about it, so we'll see. But if it'd make a difference. I'm also kind of a little bit curious if adding, like, the water, making more humid would be. Like, generally, it's, like, 40 to 50% humid outside. Yeah. So I'm, I was like, ah, it's fairly humid. You know, if it's rainy, it could be up to 80. But, like, I just looked right now on just the weather thing. It says 40%. So I'm like... Is adding that extra bit of water on the intake going to make much of a difference over the semi-humid outside air? I don't know. I'll uh, I'll have to check with to see what, what the humidity here is, but uh, I, I can guarantee it's less than 40%. So, yeah. uh, you know, here it makes a, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's fair. That's good. The yeah, other... If you do do that, let me know. I'd, I'd be curious to see what the results would be. Yeah, definitely I will. Um, I might just try rigging up something just to test it and see what happens, but we'll see. The other big, the biggest difference is hands down going to be the air exchanger, which is yeah. sitting in my entranceway that still needs to be hooked up. <laughs> I got to figure out how the heck to run all the lines to it, which is going to be the tricky part, but it's going to be next on the hit list. I think that's going to be the biggest impact I'm going to get, period, for like boosting pH, like passively. Yeah, yeah. I, I... Yes, I think that's the way to go. <laughs> no, exactly. Um... Jeremy Graham, I'm using a CO2 scrubber, but still can't hit eight. Any reasons why? Uh, it depends how much carbonates are, or hydro, not hydroxides. Yeah. Yeah. yeah how much CO2 is in your tank, basically? Yeah, you know, I, I would get um, one of the probes, and you and I've talked about this uh, before. Mm -hmm. And let's see if I can reach back and get mine. The trusty CO2 meters. The trusty CO2 meter, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, be, being able to uh, to have one of these, it'll tell you basically what the CO2 is in your uh, air naturally. Um, mm -hmm. That that may have something to do with needing to, uh, you know, add some more fresh air to uh, to this to the surrounding, Jeremy. That might help uh, boost it a little bit. So, what what does your house sit at, like average, with on the CO2 meter? Uh, if I'm not uh, cooking and I have uh, windows open, uh, it's normally right around 650. Uh, mm -hmm. if I start to close the windows a little bit, it'll start to creep. If I'm using the gas, 
uh, mm -hmm. it will go up, you know, eight eight fifty. So uh, definitely, you know, and uh, having the the gas uh, range going has a significant impact uh, mm. on the tank. Crazy. Well, yours is not too bad, but you can also open the windows a lot more. I'm about a month away for that happening more frequently. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got a pair of sliding glass doors right next to the tank. So oh, you know, it, it, it makes a difference. <laughs> However, the the air flow does not come into uh, uh, the house that way. So I have to open up mm. the garage door in the garage to be able to get a nice flow through. When I do that, I'm able to drop the CO2 in the room to around 200. Oh, wow. So yeah, it makes a significant impact when I can get a cross breeze. What is your outside CO2? Like, isn't like three, 400 like outside air? Uh, I'll have to check again, but it, uh, the last time I did was when the fires and it, it, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty bad. But okay. uh, yeah, I think it's probably you know, between 250 and 350. Okay, I'm gonna go throw mine outside later and see what it reads, I'm curious now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think your air is better than mine anyway. Well, we'll find out, never know. Oh, that's good. Uh, we'll order one of those meters. Yeah, they're, they're super handy. It just gives you an idea how much CO2 is in your house. And if you have really high CO2, you're, it's like endless battle because the ambient CO2 is going to equalize with the water as all that turbulence happens in the air exchange. So, Yeah, you know, and I found, uh, I think both you and I did this, we were so obsessed with what's the numbers when we first put them on and, you know, what's mm -hmm. the stability. And as we did stuff within the aquarium, we started to see you know, how things would adjust and, um, you know, and we could adjust the tank from there. We'd see it in the pH or yep. you know, we'd see it in the amount of just overall gas exchange. Mm -hmm. Well, the other consideration too is like pH is like logarithmic, like it's a scale and every little impact actually has more and more of an effect as you get higher. Yeah. So all these little things that we do add up and it does make a decent difference overall. So. Yeah, you know, the other thing that I've... Uh, I started to do recently is I moved away from using Chato uh, in my reactor, in my Pax Bellum, um, partially because I don't have the space for the Pax at the moment. And I've modified my um, return ATO chamber within my, uh, my water box sump um, as a refugium. And so I replaced the Chato with the uh, red OGO, OGO. Um, and I actually found that that produces a lot more oxygen in the tank uh, than the Chato did, and it seems to be mm -hmm. a lot more stable mm -hmm. at absorbing nutrients as well. So uh, really? I, I'm only about a week and a half into the experiment, but uh, I've been super happy with that switch so far. No, that's good, actually. I'm kind of curious. It's, I've like been running my refugium like longer hours too, just to, like soak up some more CO2. All these little stupid little tweaks, but yeah, <laughs> I, I also uh, uh, for Valentine's Day I, I made my wife uh, New Zealand cockles uh clams and oh nice dinner but yeah. i saved uh, five of the clams and i actually chucked them into the aquaforest uh their mud and yeah. uh they're like they're like sitting in there they buried themselves uh, halfway into the mud and i've noticed uh, just the impact that they've had on my phosphate levels in the tank too huh interesting so obviously they don't yeah. do well in warmer weather so anyone who's looking to get some mussels or clams uh, watch out in the summer because you know you're gonna cook them but uh, you know because the tank right now is like 76 or so during the, you know the day and drops down a little bit more at night uh, mm -hmm. that's their normal ambient uh, water temperature in New Zealand yeah. so uh, they've been really uh, happy as a clam in there <laughs> nice love it I always thought it'd be cool to try doing like a full like clam refugium I, I've talked to uh, the guys over at Clam Mania about that, and uh, with the next tank, my, my plan is to have a, a chamber that is going to be all clams on there. Oh, sweet. That'd be awesome. Yeah, so. I, I would want to do it. It'd be, it'd be so cool. It's like display refugium of clams. Yeah, it'd be kind of crazy to be able to, you know, just go look in your sump and see all these beautiful clams. So, you know, you'd have to get some hip hopus ones in there as well mm -hmm. as, you know, Maxima. So you balance out the beauty and the, the workhorses. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think that, that would, it's a great way from a natural nutrient exchange uh, mm -hmm. you know, to have in the tank as opposed to, you know, either vodka dosing or anything else to yep. try to, you know, balance out your nutrients. That being said, my football size squamosa, I still have high nutrients. <laughs> but that's my own fault. Yeah, but it's also <laughs> probably absorbing a lot of elk in the tank, too. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, happens. That's okay. <laughs> I know, that's okay. You gotta do what you gotta do. That's a good it's, problem it's a to have. It does. It, he, he's pretty. Although my latest, we were talking about this just before we started, but I have freaking Aptasia in my tank, and then I use Aptasia X, and I swear it just gave me more, so... 
we talk about well, you recommend the F Aptasia, which yeah, is so funny. I, so I, you know, I was a, I posted an experiment that I was looking to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, just a, just a little bit ago, and um, you know, going through all the different uh, options that I had available, you know, I found that the uh, F two um, was the most effective at not uh, getting them to spread. You know, mm-hmm. literally, you let you use the the probe and you know hit them into their head, let them close up, uh, and then you basically just cover them up like a, like a dome. And yeah. um, you know, the recommendation says a half an hour to let it wait. Uh, mm-hmm. I found actually about forty five minutes because I probably put more than uh, you know what they recommended, and so it did a great job being able to uh, to cover up and anything that was exposed did great. Um, yeah, Ryan, I see your comment about peppermint shrimp. I put ten of yeah. them in there. Never saw them again, and where I put them, didn't see a single impact on a single Epstasia. I also got uh, from Biota uh, a couple of their Epstasia eating file fish, mm-hmm. waiting for them to have a snack on them as well. So uh, I think I think that when you talk about Epstasia, it's a combination, and uh, you know you 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 have to slowly. You have a copper stop. band, and oh yeah, and I have a copper band who just doesn't do a thing for them. Yeah, so. I have a copper band in my frag tank, and he's been doing pretty good. I don't know if he's eating that page or not. He's he's picks up stuff, but yeah. it, it's hard to like catch him in the act to like verify if he's actually doing it. But he does constantly pick up stuff. So, yeah, I'll, I'll see mine. Uh, ni- you know, go into the rocks and pick stuff. But mm-hmm. I know there's no upstages in the rocks that he's nipping. So, uh, you know, I'm just happy because uh, he's doing so well. As you can see him in the background right now with my uh, with my idol. You know, sometimes they play well, sometimes they don't. So. Mm-hmm. No, that's fair. Okay, so FAPTASIA worked well for you. I've never tried this before. I literally just ordered it and got it yeah. last week. And then... So the biggest thing I found is to stir it really well. It has one of the steel balls in there, but mm-hmm. literally give it a nice good shake for a good few minutes. Yeah. Uh, Did you use the little popsicle stick to stir it? I didn't. I just gave it a really solid, uh, you know, shaker uh like a, a martini uh yeah and <laughs> yeah, that, sounds good did, did that for a couple minutes and it did the trick um i did find after so the the first time i used it i, I probably used about uh, 10 mil um and then i went to use it the next day and um, i must have pulled off more liquid than rock composite and mm-hmm. so i tried googling what i could do in that i ended up just putting in a little bit of my rodi water to it and uh, it worked. I don't know if mm-hmm. that's what you're supposed to do in that instance, um, yeah. but it, it did the trick for me to be able to allow it to be reused. Okay, that's good to know. So if you do use it out of balance, that's what I did, and it, it, it worked okay for me. It still yeah. hardened like normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Good to know. And I did not see a spike in my, uh, my parameters. My elk stayed stable. Okay, so it's not straight up kelp paste like most of them. <laughs> yeah, you'll notice yep. that the color is pink, and yeah. as, it, as it dries, it turns from pink to white. Huh. Good to know. There's, um, like, one of the best ones previously I found was just super gluing them because it kind of traps them, like, similar concept. But yeah. I'm going to try this because I'm going to see. I tried, decided to try Aptasia X, and I swear I have more, so that was a bust. But the only problem is there's still ones, like, underneath on overhangs and stuff, which you can't really douse with this stuff. So those will be tricky. Yeah, you know, like we were saying earlier, you know, about the nudie bronx for it, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna because I don't have any rasses. Well, I have a six line and, and a two cleaner rasses, but they're not gonna go mm-hmm. after them, uh, or yeah. so I hope. But yeah. um, you know, the, um, I think you could probably use like one of those takeaway trays, put it underneath the rock, and kind of inject into it, and mm-hmm. hopefully without too much of a mess, uh, get some of those on the underhang. Um, or you could just get a little bit of the reef epoxy and just epoxy that bottom spot and mm, true. Really just trap them under there. Mm, that's not a bad idea too, actually. I consider that one. I like it. Um, Tracy, thank you for the five dollars super chat. Um, the other ones are just in the comments. Was talking about the Bergia, which do work amazingly well. Yeah. However, I still worry all my rasses will eat them and they'll just be like twenty dollars snacks, which would suck. And then I've also debated buying like 10 peppermint shrimp and just throwing them in and see what they will do. Yeah, you know, I think it comes down to uh, it's one of these things you just have to be prepared to spend many months to deal with. Yeah. You know, I, I actually decided just to take out some of the rock, uh, you know, and um, I, I took off the corals that were on it and I just mm-hmm. um, um, hydrogen peroxide the whole rock. Mm, nice. That works. Mine. So- 
Yeah. See, the problem with my escape is everything's basically glued together to make all these crazy structures. So yeah, that my, happen. I, I've got a combination of solid rock and then adjustable rock, I call it. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, Filefish. Filefish can eat LPS, though. They're, they're riskier to me. It's the same. You know, I, I have one adult um, um, F-Stage eating Filefish from Biota, and mm -hmm. occasionally I'll see it nipping on some of my SPS um, on the polyps. Most of the time it's okay. I think it's just exploring. Um, the two uh, smaller new ones I got, uh, I haven't seen them nip on uh, anything other than just rock yet. So, yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're eating food and everything for me just fine, but I haven't seen them actually uh, go after and eat anything they're supposed to. Well, yeah, that's promising as long as you're eating coral. There was a guy in a local group giving one away, and I was like, has he eaten any coral? He's like, yeah, I ate all my torches and all nipping other LPS. I'm like, oh, no go. Yeah. Like, oh, I have too many torches. It'd be a disaster. You know, but, but actually, I really like the personality of them. I think they're a really cool fish. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would probably look at uh, some other reef safe uh, file fish as well uh, down the road. Um, you nice. know, th they're not the most beautiful. You know, they're kind of like this brownie yellow camera. Uh, camouflage color but um mm -hmm. you know they have such personality to them and they have this like yeah. red around their eyes so when they move their occipital lobes they can kind of uh, see it a little bit it's yeah. pretty cool well they're very unique looking too right so they're still cool in their own rights like because they're just so different yeah and, and they swim you know kind of going up and down to their mouth and so mine all congregate by my gargonia in the back corner and so they all kind of just like head down just kind of bob up mm -hmm. and down and it's it's fascinating just to watch them you know uh, in that space Mm -hmm. No, it definitely is. Battle OCR, 49 Super Chat. Thank you. Much appreciated. This is like the, the Bergia or the Peppermint Fund to rid these darn empties. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're such a pain. I, I, they are. Yeah. I'm actually going to spend some time and go hit the ball with this tonight. But I know there's all those underside ones and weird hard ones to get, which will be the challenge. Yeah, and so when you put it in, what I also found is just like uh, use a paper towel and wipe the the tip. Uh, okay. Anything that that is loose on the syringe or on the tip is just going to free fall in the water, and it will kill anything that is not uh, your intended target. So uh, definitely uh, do it with caution uh, and be mindful when you put it in slowly. Uh, just you know, go to so place. What what about the aptasia or in like the middle of a zoo colony or something? You just got to write off the ones around it. Pretty much. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, it comes with the two heads, you know, the, the long one and the bent one. Uh, yep. What I would do is I would use the long one and I would, yeah, force the uh, the mm -hmm. head of the Epstasia to close mm -hmm. uh, and then just create a mound around it so you have uh, okay. a, as least amount of, uh, of uh, surrounded casualty as possible. Yeah. Then do you suck it out afterwards or do you just leave it in there? I haven't I've seen yet. both. Yeah. Okay. Um, they, they say you within a day or so you can, like, chip it off. Um, I haven't, and mine is already changing color from white to you know, rock color. It's and part so, of the tank now. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm completely fine with it. Okay, that works. Yeah, as long as it blends in, who cares? Really, right? Yeah, like I figured, either coralline or something else is going to grow over it in no time. So mm -hmm. as long as more of stages don't grow there, I'm okay. Yep, I'll take it. So any other cool projects you've been working on lately? I know you're like me. You're always experimenting, building stuff. So I love these chats. Yeah, you know, uh, switching between the L1 to the L2 uh, mm -hmm. has been um, a, a, a challenge and a blessing. Uh, the number of trips that I've been to Home Depot and Lowe's to be able to get plumbing, uh, I can not, no longer count on two hands. So uh, it, it's been a lot of fun. And it, it's really just forced me to think about... Um, you know, how we move water from our sumps into our tanks. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know Antonio Eat Sleep Reef did one about, you know, checking the flow that we're, we get in our sumps. And it had me thinking, you know, like, you know, how many bends is too many? And should I really be focused on minimizing the number of bends? So uh, I, you know, tried to really plotting out um, a, a different way to both minimize friction and keep uh, uh, a certain level and plane. Mm -hmm. Uh, with my plumbing so now i have them um, i've been working on this design where they're only at two planes so i yep. have two systems going in play one is to feed the automatic top off which will be my refugium mm -hmm. um, and there i used a half inch uh, white pvc plumbing and then i used a one inch plumbing to go to the uh, the main return and then mm -hmm. three quarter to go from the return into my chiller and then back into my uv 
Yep. Now, ideally, I'd want to go the UV first, then the chiller to cool down the water. But mm. just the way that I have it uh, spaced out in the in the system, it just wasn't possible to do. So uh, mm -hmm. I currently have it set to go from the return to the chiller to the UV and then back in. So yeah. Uh, that's so, been a, a, a good project. And the other mm -hmm. thing that I've been experimenting with is um, using different types of, um, obviously, unions, but, uh, but check valves. And mm -hmm. um, with check valves that can be done, used vertically as opposed to horizontally. Mm -hmm. And so because of uh, that two-plane system I have, uh, I don't have the head height necessary for one of the check valves. So it's like six and three quarters inches, and I just don't have that space. Yeah. And so, and looking at check valves, I was uh, dabbling between spring-loaded and just the the flap, the mm -hmm. swing. And so um, I ended up picking up one of the swing ones from Flow Control. And while they're designed to be run vertically, and disclaimer, they're designed to be run vertically, uh, they do Still work works. horizontally. Yep. As long as you put the flap on the top, so back pressure closes it. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, I've experimented with that, yeah. and I was able to get it um, to work horizontally. So uh, I'm able to keep that at play, and uh, so far that project is, is coming along and looking good. Nice. So, okay, so question. Yeah. Do you need the check valve, or it's just nice to have the check valve? Like, can your sump actually handle that excess flow if required? Yeah, uh, it, it, it can and it has before with my four random flow generators. Yeah, uh, it hasn't been an issue. Um, the thing that I want to do differently is I actually want to put the random flow generators pointing straight to the back and down mm -hmm. so that I get um, a lot of flow to the back of the mm -hmm. tank because I've been playing around with the configuration of my my gyres and and my um, my other uh, power heads in the tank is before I had them all in the back, just pushing water forward. Yeah. And that was obviously the cleanest for the bare bottom, but I noticed that the corals weren't necessarily happy. And so I put um, the FX uh, 330s going right to left, and I kind of have them off, off center a bit so they can kind of create some overlapping swells. Uh, and then I have two of the power heads, um, the Nano uh, uh, Nero 5s, in the back just pointing straight. But I, no I noticed that I'm starting to collect some of the detritus in the back on the bottom. So mm -hmm. what I want to do is I want to use uh, two of the four um, random flow generators just to point straight down and just Interesting. to kick yeah. up anything that's in the bottom. And it's because of that that I think having the check valve in there uh, would be important because there's no way that the sump could be able to handle, you know, mm -hmm. that extra few it, inches, that extra. Yeah, it, it's probably the equivalent of 10 extra gallons of water. Now, as this other random side out, you could drill a little hole in the bottom of it. It's like a little siphon break. That way, siphon if the water break. drops below that, it will stop yeah. the siphon. Yeah, that, that was next on my list. I was just, uh, th that was the last resort. <laughs> to just stack up all the stuff, extra safe. I did see that Lockline actually makes a, a, a check valve uh, system. So really? anyone, Yeah, <laughs> anyone who's interested in checking that out, uh, Lockline's uh, website has all that. And... Uh, it looks pretty cool. Some of the reviews I saw, on, on the other hand, um, said that it did restrict quite a bit of the flow. Mm -hmm. Again, I, if I'm going to be using a L2 with 3,300 gallons an hour return, going a head height of six feet, mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to be an issue in, in terms of... Yeah, you of, got lost uh, of headroom. Yeah, of, of lost uh, friction there. Um, however, from a cleanliness perspective, I was worried yeah. um, how easy would it be to pull that lock apart I'd have mm -hmm. to buy one of the clippers to pull it out and then be able to clip it back together. So, um, yeah, it, it's something that I will keep in mind as a as a fail safe. Uh, but for right now, uh, um, the check valve I think is the safer way to go. You could, yeah, for sure. But if the lock line, if if your bulkheads are threaded, I'd almost just make two of them and just swap them out and let the other one soak in citric acid every six months or something. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. Um, I don't think, uh, well, I actually, I, I think Antonio did come up with uh, some threaded um, RPGs. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I can definitely look into some various options there. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, so again, one of the experiments that I've been looking at is uh, creating different flow cycles uh, within the tank. And, you know, how do I create different zones that are going to allow um, for both nutrient exchange, but also some of that cleanliness, which is why I go for a bare bottom tank to begin with. Yeah.
Ah, your bare bottoms. I still can't bring myself to do it in the display. <laughs> the frag tank's bare bottom. But. You, you know, I actually recently had been thinking, you know, maybe I should put some uh, some thicker gravel in there and try it again. And yeah. then I reminded myself of the litter box and cleaning it. And then I was like, nah, nah, I'm okay. Well, I guess if it's like full of corals and stuff, then it works. Yeah, you know, I have like half of the bottom is covered with, uh, actually, I think since our last uh, chat, I, I moved my Jason Fox uh, jack-o'-lantern uh, mm -hmm. from the back of the tank up to the front. And then in order yeah. to, to move it, I actually had to break it uh, into two pieces. So now I literally have a football-sized piece of jack-o'-lantern nice. plus a, a frag that is, you know, the size of my hand uh, that's going to start to cover the bottom. So uh, oh, that'll, that'll look cool. Yeah, I've been trading some with some local reefers uh, who need a piece, but uh, you know, it'll look cool when the whole bottom of that is orange on one side, and then I have green star polyps on the other. Oh, look really cool! It's a nice contrast, the orange and green too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Omar, keep spreading the knowledge. Love learning on these live streams. Love sharing it, and thank you. Hey, thanks, Omar. Yep. But uh, yeah, no, the orange and green will look really cool together. Like it's. Yeah, I don't know if I can get. Let's see if I can. Yeah. Yeah, that'll, that'll look pretty cool. Although, yeah. I, I wonder if the GSP will overgrow it at times. Oh, I, I'm sure it will. Uh, I'm going to have to cut <laughs> it back. I do notice that the uh, um, the my gold torch there my, uh, does help to keep it at bay. So uh, I'm, I may have to find some alternate ways of, uh, of keeping uh, the polyps from spreading over too much. Because the last thing I want them is to like completely take over. Yeah, I, they're, they're easy to peel off, I guess. I gave my buddy, um, Dylan, my one buddy who has like the floating tank on the yeah, wall. Yeah, floating tank, yeah. Yeah, so I, I gave him some GSP because I, I was like out of space. I'm like, here you go. I'm like, keep this safe for me. It's like, psh, it's growing like crazy in this tank now. It's starting to grow up the back wall and the whole thing will be all like fuzzy and stuff. It'll look cool once the whole back wall is green, but yeah, it should be fun. Uh, that'll be really cool. And sorry, I just saw in the video that uh, you guys didn't get a chance to really see uh, the tank. So let me try that again. Uh, we, we saw your stand doors. Yeah, I know. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> but let me know if you can actually see it and not my stand doors. Yeah, no, you're good now. All right. Well, they would take two there. You Sorry. have a solid, solid size chunk of it right below the Duncans and between yeah, the GSP. Yeah, I mean, so, so that that Duncan is like the size of two fists. Nice. And so uh, I think there's probably about a hundred heads on it, and you can see, um, you know, the, the couple of different sizes and pieces of it there. So yeah, it's it's covering up. Beauty. That was looking good. I um, my next thing I was thinking. In my sump, I have this big open space, so I think I'm gonna turn that to like an LPS section now for my frag yeah. tank. So I can steal more space up top. So that might be my next little project is find some type of... I'm still going to do for lights and stuff down there, but do something down there and make a little frag section. Oh, that'll look really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be good. Got to capitalize on all that space. <laughs> you know, uh, we don't have enough space for either the technology Ever. that we want to try or different zones and environments for our stuff. Yeah, we, mm -hmm. we have to get creative. I was even looking at ways to put a little nano tank uh, over uh, a part of my where my filter socks are. And yep. so that I can just have them there and have it floating in there so that I could have just a little nano cool. tank in there. Hmm. It would be cool. I, I think the engineering to make that reality is, is more than the time I'm willing to spend. But <laughs> a couple holes in the side of the little bulkhead for your return and so drain back in your sump. Be easy. Yeah. Easy yeah. peasy. I, I still have my daughter's uh, little nano tank to set up too. So yeah, uh, nice. that, that little, I have to do that first before this next project. Yeah, fair, fair enough. <laughs> That'll be good, though. Um, yeah. So for that, I'm actually planning to run a, a metal halide on that little 15-gallon uh, water box tank. So uh, <laughs> that's overkill. <laughs> I'm super excited to put that. I, I've been sure to, I haven't debated between the the 70 watt or 150 watt metal halide on it yet, but uh, okay. I, so I, I have to ask: you have a chiller and you're worried about cooling, and you're like, boom, halide. Yeah. On a nano. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Just food for thought. You, you know, it, it is what it is. <laughs> fair enough. I'll just put some ice packs back there. Yeah, fair enough. Just checking. <laughs> That'll be good. Have you seen those little, like, um, I don't think they're called Petri, like Petir or what, Petir coolers or whatever, like those little tiny mini chillers that they have for nano tanks? Uh, I haven't seen them used as a nano tank, but um, I know my wife has her... Uh, um, cosmetic fridge, and I thought about you know, maybe uh, mm -hmm. you know drilling in one of those and using that uh, instead. So um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that stuff. It, it totally worked. Yeah, they, ha I think they're called like Petir or Petri coolers or something like that. But they're basically like a little plate with a heat sink on it, and it can 
generate a lot of cool. Like, have you seen those automatic fish food feeders? Yeah. Frozen, that's been coming out for like 10 years. Two, two probably, but eventually it'll come out. But that's basically what it does. It has one of those little pet, pet here, pet tree, whatever the heck it is. Coolers on the bottom, a little 3D printed thing. So it holds it on that frozen plate, basically. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't know. It's a cool idea. Yeah. Uh, I also saw some of my friends in Japan um, have these mm-hmm. like little um, nano um, chillers and heater combos. Yeah. And, and so uh, I... Ooh. Sorry, I'm fixing my camera so you guys can actually see my tank instead of the clock. Um, now he's got your mouth, though. It's reverse home improvement Wilson style. <laughs> <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to win. It is. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll try mm-hmm. that. Um, but yeah, I, so my friends in Japan are using these like little things. And they're basically mm-hmm. like the size of maybe, you know, four of yep. your iPhones put together um, mm-hmm. as a little heat exchange and cooler chiller. So I, I thought about being able to find one of those and, uh, and ship them over. Uh, to use for the nano tank. Do you you have a GHL control in your tank, don't you? I do. Yeah. Yeah, they have they have one of those for like heater cooler thing. I remember seeing it at um, one of the shows like a year or two ago. Hmm. Okay. So you I might will... already have a solution. You could just plug and play. Who That'll work for the big tank, but I'm not sure it'll work for the nano. Especially, it'll be in a, a different part of the house. Yeah. No, that's fair. Food for thought, though. Could work. I definitely like it. And uh, you yep. know, the idea behind that tank is to keep a super simple tank and just see if I can uh, use it as a grow-out tank. Mm-hmm. Perfect. That'd be good. I'll overflow slash kid tank. Yeah. You know, I, I was also <laughs> thinking um, you know, maybe to do it as a, as a macro tank as well and just let some you know, interesting LGs you know, take play in there. So. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of really cool ones, like Shaving Bush and like Dragon's Breath. Like, there's a lot of really yeah. pretty macros so be cool to do yeah i i forgot his name but there's a reefer in europe uh who has his main tank but then he has a uh, a macro tank and then nice. he's got two squid in there i believe oh, cool. or two cuttlefish i, I can't remember oh, which one it is that'd be awesome uh, yeah um, I, I i'm sorry i blanking on his name i follow him on instagram yep. too but it, it's always uh you know cool when i see the pictures of that and how mm-hmm. uh, you know you create these little different environments which you don't normally see uh within the within your tanks yeah, I would do a bunch of like pipe fish and that type of stuff in there, which I think would be really cool. Yeah, you know, I don't see many pipe fish around here, but that would definitely be really cool. I had one in my old lagoon tank. It disappeared. I never knew what happened to it. Then when I was upgrading, moved the tank. I saw his little like behind the tank, little dried up guy. I was like, oh. no, because he was such a cool fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, they're cool. I, I think doing something uh, with that uh, could be definitely a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Okay. Aaron Saskasian, I'm saying your name wrong, I apologize, but thank you for the $10 super chat. Finally caught alive. Thank you for all the help and info. You're most welcome, and thank you as well. <laughs> Thanks for answering all my dumb questions on Instagram. No problem. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> well, do you have any of the questions you have us live? Yeah, if you guys got any questions in the chat, let us know. I know you have a hard stop in about 13 minutes, so I if you guys got that. any questions, sneak them in now. Before the before the family dinners, that's right. Uh, and and Aptasia hunting. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Let me know what you what you think of it. Um, you know, I, I was definitely super impressed. Uh, you know, I, I admit after okay. I saw the the BRS the video, uh, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm sold on this. I'm gonna have to give it a try. And yeah, uh, it it lived up to my expectations and exceeded uh, the results. Awesome. Yeah, I've had a few people recommend it to me now. So finally, when the last time I ordered from BRS, I'm like, yeah, hey, I'm gonna try it. So. It's been sitting here for a week, and I guess today is going to be the did day. Did you get the one ounce uh, or the two ounce? Uh, uh, two ounce. But yeah. Yeah, so I've gone through about half of it right now. And, okay. Uh, I've gone through a quarter of my tank. So uh, y- you, uh, depending on how liberal you are at using it, you mm-hmm. may need to get another one. Okay, good to know. Uh, where did he get his Moorish Idol? Uh, so uh, I've got this Moorish Idol from a local importer, and uh, I got her when she was the size of my palm. Um, what's unique about her is she only has one eye, and so that was part of the reason why I was able to uh, to get her, um, because no one, none of the shops would. And so my friend, knowing that I've kept them for many years, uh, knew mm-hmm. that I'd be able to, uh, to keep her in good nick, and if anyone could keep her alive, uh, I, I'd be able to give her a good chance. So. Uh, nice. She has a damaged uh, uh, fin as well, so you sometimes see it when she swims by. There's a bit of a gap in there, so uh, mm-hmm. whether it was some shipping uh, issues that she had or how she was collected, but um, she is a Hawaii-based uh, Moorish Idol. 
Um, so what that means is she's more of an, an algae-based eater as opposed to the Indonesian more dolls, which tend to be more sponge-based eaters. So um, <laughs> nice. I've had her now going on five years. She's a full-fledged adult, and she runs the roost in the tank. And uh, <laughs> she definitely lets uh, between the regal, which sometimes they like to sleep in the same spot and fight, or, mm -hmm. uh, or the powder blue know uh, that she's the boss. Nice. Yeah, it's definitely a pretty fish and very unique. You know, they have such personality. You know, she'll let me pet her, hand feed her. You know, she'll literally nice. do some circles around my hand when I put it in, in the tank. And, you know, like what I tell everyone when they, when they, if they get this fish, uh, is to really spend a lot of time getting to know them. Each, each one of our fish have a personality. Um, but tricky fish like, you know, Moorish idols or, you know, tangs, the more you know them and understand their personality um, and see what they like, what they pick at, uh, the better chances you are to keep them healthy longer, you know, and for mm -hmm. their own, you know, sanity in your aquarium. Yep. Um, you know, and so I'll give you an example. So um, a while back ago, uh, actually, when we were, uh, my wife was giving birth, um, I was only able to come to the from the hospital once a day to feed the tank. And so... Mm -hmm my Rigo got pissed and my Morshido got pissed. And so they, they started nipping on things. Mm. And um, my Morshido started nipping on my SPS, but I realized oh. it was only, <laughs> at first it was red corals, then it moved mm -hmm. to green corals. Hmm. And so for whatever, uh, I then learned how they see color contrast. And yeah. so they only see like dark to light. And so what I got, what I realized was, you know, the amount of protein that I was feeding them in largely at the time mice shrimp wasn't enough. And so I started at that point, and we've talked about this before, to augment krill and other higher protein-based foods. Mm -hmm. And since I started doing that, I get zero picking on any mm -hmm. of the coral. So um, yep. that just tells me that the fish's metabolism, and same with my antheus in there as well, that they needed much more higher protein-based foods than I was giving them with mice shrimp and even some brine shrimp. So um, again, you know, the more exotic the fish, the more we need to do to make make sure that we understand their dietary needs and that we're meeting them as they begin to grow as well. Like, you know, she's a full fledged adult in there. And, uh, you know, so she eats three times a day and I probably go through one of the, the flat packs of, um, San Francisco Bay krill, um, in about a, between three and four weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. So, but yeah, that, that's a huge key point though, is if a fish is hungry, it's going to be more opportunistic and it's more likely to nip at stuff where if they're well fed, they're less likely to start picking at random things. Yeah. And, and so mm -hmm. just like understand their, their habits. Like sometimes I've noticed my fish like to eat at a certain time of day and not at others. So mm -hmm. right, like, for example, like mine like to eat at 8 a.m. If I put the, if I wait and put the food in at nine, they won't mm -hmm. eat it. They'll just like look at it, occasionally pick, and then it'll be wasted. But yep. at eight in the morning, they'll devour the food. So mm -hmm. it's just like something in the own, you know, circadian rhythm said that this is the time we need to eat and we're going to eat. Yep. Well, if you can learn that and tailor to it, I mean, that's key. Yeah, I mean, that's, I guess, one of the benefits of uh, you know, being home a little bit more often these days is that, you know, mm -hmm. everyone's been able to spend a lot more time in their tanks and just tinkering and playing. Yeah, exactly. Okay, question from the chat here from Aaron. Any success running a heater off a car inverter? Just bought a 2000 watt car inverter. I figure I can keep the heater going for a few hours. So two things to know. It depends on how much your heater draws, but your main issue could possibly pop in your little lighter socket. Depends on how big that fuse is. Yeah. So if it has the little alligator clips to hook your car battery, I'd hook it directly to your car battery and then run it to your heater and run it that way that you're not worrying about the little fuse in the middle. And the other consideration is like, depends on like i don't know how fast it will drain your car battery but i'd probably just go start the car every like two hours or so just make sure you top it off just to be safe and make sure you open your door so you don't get carbon monoxide poisoning mm -hmm. <laughs> well cl close yeah, yeah if it's in your garage or where it is but yeah, yeah. a big extension cord into the house <laughs> that's right yeah exactly but yeah just hook it directly to the battery if you can rather than through the cigarette lighter that's the biggest bit of advice i do on that one uh, Christian running a 150 watt heater and a utility pump with an inverter. No problems. Okay. Perfect. Cool. Inverter's ready for 300 watts. I tried 200 watts inverter turned off. Yeah. So the other thing is too, with some devices, there's like a static load and like a spike load. And usually when it first kicks on, there'll be like a spike of power and then we'll level out. You just got to make sure it can handle whatever that is. And I think you have with your apex, you were able to see what your power consumption is, correct? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I have yet to find on my GHL a, a way to do that easily. Uh, I don't know if it tells than, you or not, actually. Yeah. I, uh, Does it? I don't know. I, I've yet to find that uh, that option. So if, if you find it, or uh, Vinny, if you're watching this, uh, would definitely be keen to find a way to see uh, all the power that's running through it. Yeah, I'm curious now, too. I'll, I'll look later. That's something I haven't even thought of to try and dig into yet on there. Yeah, there's so many things. I know. There, there is a lot. You just got to find it. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the good thing, and, and whether it's a, uh, you know, an a a Apex or a GHL, there's enough yep. forums out there to be able to uh, see. If we've thought about it, I'm sure someone else has as well, and there's probably a thread out there going through the same thing. And so, um, you know, being able to, to tap into those resources definitely is a good thing. Nope, definitely. All right, buddy. You got about five minutes until I know you got to go. Yeah. Um, any last questions in the chat before we call it for today? Um, ho hopefully everyone out there, if you guys are in Texas or any of those storm areas, hopefully your tanks are doing good and surviving all the chaos. I know it sucks to be out of power for a day plus. It's a long time, yeah. especially with the tank. Yeah, d definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my thoughts and heart go out to everyone dealing with uh, some mm -hmm. tank issues and power and family associated things with that right now. So definitely hope things can improve. You know, yep. I, I got to see uh, a couple pictures of tanks that had frozen over in Texas. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the poor kid that I saw in there was like screaming because his fish tank turned to ice. Wow. That's crazy. So yeah, Oof. definitely. Uh, let, let's hope, uh, this polar vortex though warms up a little. Yep, exactly. All right, guys, I'll call her cause I know you got to run, but stay safe out there and hopefully everyone is doing well and surviving and hopefully nice, lovely, warm spring weather soon for everybody. Indeed. Thank you for having me on, Devin. As always, awesome. I appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. As always, if you enjoyed it, hit the like button. If you need to make sure you subscribe. Want to check out Aaron's Instagram? Check out the links below. And thank you guys again for tuning in.